In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Please be seated. Whatever you did to the least of these, you did to me. For a deacon preaching on today's gospel should be a slam dunk. It's a challenge, though, to avoid just making this into another do more sermon. I'm sure you've heard those, you know. Whatever you're doing for God, you must do more. And part of the problem with that is that many of you are doing plenty already. But a couple of weeks ago, as I was ruminating on this passage, thinking of what to preach on, I was at a dinner party where the conversation turned religious. And one person said that when we get to the pearly gates, and I'm not sure she said pearly gates, but I'm paraphrasing, she believes we'll be asked, what did you do to lift others up? And I spoke up and said, can I steal that? <laughs> it's not the most earth-shaking insight, but it's an excellent summary of our gospel today. What did you do to lift others up? It poses a challenge to care for the least of these among us, but also a promise that those who do will inherit the kingdom. This parable brings to a close the Olivet Discourse, which begins in chapter 24 with what's called the Little Apocalypse, where Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. He's standing on the Mount of Olives, just east of Jerusalem. I was there back in January. You can look across the Kidron Valley, where there's a modern highway running now, and see the Temple Mount, where the drama of Jesus' trial and crucifixion will unfold. It's a really dramatic setting for this discourse. The Olivet Discourse is the last of five bodies of teaching in Matthew's Gospel, beginning with the Sermon on the Mount, and um, echoing, ending with the Olivet Discourse, and that echoes the five books of the Torah of Moses. And just as the first of these discourses takes place on a mountain, so does this last one. The little apocalypse ends with the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And then we get the series of parables we've heard over the past few weeks. The five wise and five foolish virgins reminding us to be prepared. The parable of the talents urging us to steward the resources God has given us. And now we return to the Son of Man coming in glory with the angels. And the king gathers the nations for judgment. He separates them, the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. And to the sheep he says, come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And why are they blessed? Because I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. The sheep are bewildered. They never recognized him as the one they were feeding, welcoming, clothing, caring for, visiting in prison. But truly I tell you, he says, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Members of my family, by the way, as our translations attempt to be more inclusive than the literal Greek word here, which is brothers. If you grew up with the King James Version, as I did, the least of these, my brethren, will be the familiar wording. And some modern versions were rendered as brothers and sisters. But who are Jesus' brothers and sisters, the members of his family whom we are called to care for? There is more difference among uh, Christians, uh, difference of opinion among Christians about this than you might think. Uh, in the more progressive denominations such as ours, we pretty much take it as a given that uh, the, this phrase, these members of my family, refers to all who are in need, that Jesus is in solidarity with all the poor and marginalized. Some other groups think of the least of these, my brethren, in more exclusive terms as the needy within the church, the idea being that Jesus' brethren must be Christians, and so he's just telling us to take care of each other within the church, right? And there are arguments over whose job it is to care for the poor, individuals versus the churches versus the government. Some would say it's the church's job and not the government's, which I'd say, well, to the church, we'll get on it, right? Or, or that it's all up to individual charity. The problem with this appeal to the separation of church and state is that in the cultural and political context of the Gospels, there isn't the kind of division uh, that we think of today between government and religion. 
In the Jewish community, the temple in Jerusalem was an economic as well as a religious institution, and they lived in a Roman Empire in which the emperors were revered as gods. So it doesn't translate directly to our context. But anyway, I wonder if God cares about these distinctions at all. Does it matter whether it falls to us as individuals or the church or society at large or big government to care for the least? Or is it all of the above? And we can have a range of opinions about that. But it does seem important to note that at this scene of judgment, it's the nations that are gathered before the throne. It's the nations that are being judged. And so some of the hair splitting over the role of government and all this strikes me as making excuses for inaction and even for tolerating injustice. Uh, if you think of our lesson from Ezekiel, uh, he talks about the fat and strong sheep butting the weaker ones and scattering them far and wide. They're putting down the least of these instead of lifting them up. And that kind of injustice just goes, continues to be un corrected if we, if we do nothing. This parable is showing us the characteristics then of a just society. When we think about making this a more just society, there are big systemic responses that may come to mind, like advocating for criminal justice reform or ensuring that communities like Flint, Michigan and those in poorer countries have access to clean water. And some of us may be called to work on these things. At the same time, Jesus frames our care for the least in terms that suggest personal one-on-one -on -one interactions. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was in prison, and you visited me. And it's in these personal interactions especially that we can potentially see Christ in those we care for, as the parable tells us. You may know the story of St. Martin of Tours. He was a Roman soldier in the fourth century, and he actually was uh, preparing for baptism at this time as a catechumen. He encountered a half-naked beggar and cut his cloak in two and gave half of it to the beggar. Martin was, uh, the next night, Martin saw Jesus in a dream, wearing the cloak he had given to the beggar. And in the dream, Jesus said to him, Martin, who is still but a catechumen, clothed me with this robe. And I had once my own kind of mystical experience along these lines, which I've spoken of once before in a sermon. Uh, while doing street ministry with Operation Night Watch one night, I had this kind of out-of-body seeming feeling experience that was like seeing Jesus actually standing in the same space as the street person we were talking with. It was very momentary, but really vivid. Stories like these bring to mind our baptismal vow to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you. This promise is about much more than going to heaven when you die. It's about the dawning of a new creation, a world transformed by the love of God, which we take part in making present whenever we care for the least of these a world where none are in need, where all are family, where in the words of our mission statement, all are welcome, all are fed, and all are loved, where we act to lift up one another, to lift up the needy in our midst, whether they are known to us or strangers. As individuals, we aren't all required to do all these things. You know, it's not one person only has so much to give. The categories of need given our gospel today aren't a shopping list or bingo card where you have to check off every item, and they're not exhaustive. They are, though, vivid examples that provide, provoke reflection and discernment about our specific vocations. If Jesus were telling this parable today to us, I wonder if it would include uh, different examples, maybe ones like these. I was in a nursing home and you visited me. I was gay and you accepted me for who I was. I couldn't make bail and you paid it for me. My baby needed diapers and you bought me some. I came to the community dinner and you sat with me and listened to me. And we might think of others. As I said at the beginning, maybe you're doing plenty already to serve Christ and those who are in need. And in that case, you're doing great. I don't want to burden you with more, but to encourage you that you are loving God by loving your neighbor because he is present in the least of these, and in the process, you are inheriting the kingdom. 
But as we go about our lives this week, let's continue to ask ourselves, what will you do to lift others up? You may get a glimpse of the kingdom prepared for you, and in those you care for, you just might see Jesus.